Very, very, very lovely night. And then Christmas Eve. I thought we had a nice, uh, a nice group of folks for our Christmas Eve service, which uh, uh, we're going to add to that and make that even better next year. And so uh, looking forward to that. Amen. Amen. Uh, thinking about today, last Sunday of the year, uh, it just dawned on me that I, you know, I want, I, I'm really full of thankfulness to God for all that He's done. And it's, it's great to take moments in our life to just stop and just give thanks. And, and that's really kind of where my heart was today. And so as I was thinking about this for a few weeks ago, I thought, you know, I just want to speak on the faithfulness of God. And so if you would, turn to a very famous passage in Lamentations. It might be uh, not a famous book. You might have a hard time finding. It's on page 698 in my Bible. But uh, Lamentations is in the Old Testament right after Jeremiah. And uh, there's a, it's, it's a, it's kind of a, it's a sad book because in many ways it's, it's crying out to God. But it's also a, a positive uh, book because it speaks of who God is and how we can trust Him even in those difficult times. And that's really the message of, of trusting God and, and having uh, a connection to His faithfulness is you really wouldn't understand what His faithfulness was all about unless you had to go through the hard times too. And so that's really what we're going to look at today is take a moment to kind of focus on that. Lamentations 3, verse 22 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, thank you today for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord God, that there is no rock like our God. There is no one that we can depend on like you. And so, Lord God, we stand upon that truth today. Lord, I pray that as we close out this year, that, Lord, you would create that emotion in every heart today, one of thankfulness, one of faith in the faithfulness of God, one that, Lord, allows us to walk out of here today with a rock-solid confidence that we are in the hands of a faithful God. And Lord, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I look back upon this year, boy, this year was full of stuff. I, I don't normally watch a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, end-of-the-year uh, summary programs, but I happened to glance at one for a few minutes the other night, and it just it went on and on about, you know, all the different things that have happened this year. Boy, there's just a lot of stuff that's happened this year. And a lot of, a lot of major things in the news... Uh, that have happened that have caused concern and crises around the world. And I, I stopped, and, and as I was getting ready for this message today, I wanted to ask a question, and that's usually where I start a sermon preparation, is it's usually with a question. And then uh, if it's a question I have, or it's a question that somebody's asked me, or somebody has posed, or I think people are asking in, uh, in large numbers, I, I like to try and answer those questions. And I think that's a good way to approach the word. And so one of the things that, that I asked as I was looking at this, uh, at some of these year-end programs is, what is the greatest need in the world today? You know, when you see what's going on, when you see all the, all the stuff in the news, when you hear all the, all the concerns, what is the greatest need that there is in the world today? And I think the answer it's easy for me and maybe for you as well as we're sitting in here in church and in this context, but I think the answer to that is that people need to know God. Because if they knew God, there's so many of the issues that we, we've seen, such as the riots in Ferguson and, and the, you know, in New York and all these things, if these people knew God, it would change things. If, if they had a relationship with God it would, and they understood who God really is and how He works in our lives, I think it would change the way people look at their lives. And it would change the way that they respond to different circumstances in their life, whether they're good or bad. And so I believe one of the best ways to get to know God is to have a greater understanding and to experience His qualities 
and his character. I mean, how do you get to know people? How do you get to know people that you know in your life, whether it's your, your spouse or your friends or your coworkers or somebody you know here from the church? How do you get to know them? Well, you, you get to know them by spending time with them. But you begin to know them by their character. And, and a lot of us, you, you know, if you ask, what can you tell me about the person sitting next to you? All right, don't shout it out right now. But what can you tell me about the person you sit next to? Well, you can say, well, they, are, they, they have a lot of determination, or they are very honest, or they're very responsible, or they're thoughtful, or they're punctual, or they're not punctual. <laughs> they're patient. They're, they're full of compassion, or they're diligent, or they're lazy, or they're rude, or they're careless, or they're trustworthy. I mean, a lot of, kind of these kinds of things are going to come out when you start la- you know, looking at the person next to you and say, hmm, you know, how do I, you know, what do I know about this person? And so you come up with these qualities. Well, in much the same way, we, uh, we, we, uh, our knowledge of God is based on our experience of these kinds of qualities with God. If, if God has, has answered some amazing prayer for you, and He's come through for you in a time of need, you're going to say, God is faithful. Or if, if you have been sick, or you, uh, you had a, a terrible disease, and God healed you of it, you're going to say, God is my healer. And he's a healer. That's, how, that's who God is. Or if you're, your, your greatest experience is, is salvation, you say, God is a forgiver. And oh, how he forgives me, and how, how he's full of grace, and how he's full of mercy. And you begin to, to understand that's who God is, because those are the things you have experienced with God. And so I believe that, that those qualities are going to shape your understanding of God, and your attitude to God, and how you live uh, in this life in response to God. So I'm going to take one of those qualities and I want to focus on that today and that is his faithfulness. I think that we we need to understand this quality of God because it is one that is not just to certain people, it is one that is to all. And it is a quality of God that is affects it affects all of us and it's one that as we look back upon 2014 and as we are just a few days away from 2015, it should permeate your understanding of what God has done and what God will do in your life and in the, our lives as a, as a church family as well. All right, number, number one, God is faithful. All right, pretty simple. That wasn't a trick question. All right. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant to love to a thousand of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. 1 Corinthians 1 9. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And 1 Thessalonians 5. The one who calls you is faithful. And he will do it. All right? Just a sampling of the many verses in the Bible that speak of the faithfulness of God. So it is not a question. It is not a, hmm, is God faithful? If the answer to that is absolutely beyond doubt, God is faithful. Make no mistake about it. That's who he is. That's, that's what we can count on is, him, is, is he is going to be that kind of a God. So now that we know that God is faithful, what does it mean that God is faithful? What does faithful actually mean? Let's take a moment and just kind of look at that. Well, by definition, I love looking up definitions because they actually they, they kind of surprise you sometimes. But the, 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 the word faithful means absolute reliability, firm constancy, complete freedom from arbitrariness or fickleness. I'm sure glad God isn't fickle. But how many know a lot of us are pretty fickle? But God is faithful, not fickle. Steadfast, loyal love toward his people, constant and true. He is faithful to keep his promises. He is worthy of trust. I love that, uh, that bumper sticker I've seen before. I haven't seen it in a long time, but it said, God said it, I believe it, that's all there is to it. He's trustworthy. He keeps his promises unchangeable in his ethical nature. 
You know, sometimes we think of the word unchangeable as being inflexible, and we think of it as, as a bad thing. If something is unchangeable. I'll tell you something. There are some things I'm really glad they are not changeable. How many are glad that the sun rises every day? Whether you see it in the Northwest or not is another question. All right? But it rises and sets every day. And I'm thankful for that, because if it didn't do that, we'd be in a heap of trouble. There, there are things that you are glad that are unchangeable, that they, they stay the same. Well, God's the same way. God never changes. And that's a good thing, because that means you, you know that if God was faithful yesterday, He's faithful today, and guess what? Tomorrow, He will be faithful as well. And so we can't look at 2014 and say, whew, well, I'm sure glad God was faithful in 2014, but man, I'm really worried about 2015. No, you can count on it. God doesn't change. And that's an amazing thing to understand. It's a, it's a, there's the, the big word for it is immutable, and that's he's unchangeable. He never, no, it, it cannot be any different. God is always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. He is always the same. And that's a good thing. It's not a boring thing, it's a good thing. Because that means you can count on him. Because he will be loving. He will be faithful. He will be kind. He will be merciful. He will be all these things. And you can count on it. That it wasn't just that he was in a good mood today and he'll be in a bad mood tomorrow. You know that God is always going to be that. So that's an amazing quality. I could preach a whole message just on that. Also, we know that in the Old Testament, the word faithful meant to prop or to stay or to support such as one may safely lean upon. And so it is something that holds you up. It is something that, that props you. It is, it, is, it is faithful. And so God is faithful means that God <coughs> is a being upon whom we can absolutely rely or stay ourselves. We can trust Him. You know, we, we could use more faithfulness in our own lives. Uh, Senator Mark Hatfield went on a tour with Mother Teresa once in Calcutta and saw the work that she was doing there. And you, you don't know what things are like in that part of the world unless you've actually been there, let me tell you. It's the people that um, I used to host uh, mission teams that would come to Sri Lanka and to that part of the world. And uh, let me tell you, the culture shock when they got off the plane something to behold. And when they, when they saw, I mean, they've seen pictures, but when they get there and they see it in reality, and they smell it, and they experience it, it's a whole different world. And Mark Hatfield was with Mother Teresa in the, in the work she was doing in Calcutta, India. And he said, how can you bear this, the load without being crushed by it? And her response is very famous. She said, my dear Senator, I am not called to be successful. I am called to be faithful. And that's what she did. She hung in there and was faithful to the end in the work that God had called her to do. Bill Gothard once said that the definition of dependability is fulfilling what I agreed to do even though it requires unexpected sacrifices. You see, sometimes we're willing to do something as long as it doesn't hurt. As long as it doesn't put me out. As long as it doesn't take more time than I was expecting. As long as it doesn't cost me a little more than I was expecting. You know, then it suddenly we change. No. Dependability says, I will be there. I will show up. I will do what's needed of me, regardless of how much it costs me, regardless of how much sacrifice, regardless of the, the time and the energy and the effort that I have to put in. Even though it's ten times what I expected, a hundred times what I expected, I will still follow through because that's what it means to be dependable. Well, guess what? That's the way God is with you and me. You know, we talk about that quality amongst ourselves, but it's God's faithfulness that we, we, can, we can rejoice in today. It's because it doesn't matter. I mean, he may have gotten in there with you and said, man, you're a harder case than I thought. <laughs> you know? Whoa, you know, I really, I, I really didn't think you were going to be this difficult to work with. But, uh, 
you know, maybe I should throw in the towel. No, God never says that, and he never thinks that, and he never does that. He knows you, he made you, he created you, and he knows all of the pain you're going to cause him. And yet he still loves you. And he still promises that he will be there for you to the end. He's faithful. He's faithful. And of course, in the great words of Dr. Seuss, Brian's favorite author, In, uh, <laughs> in his classic work, Horton Hears a Who, he said, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful, 100%. <laughs> Can't get any clearer than that. And so faithfulness is a quality to be admired. It's a quality of God that is, is one that we understand he is going to be there and so if we know he's going to be there, then we need to learn how to trust in that. We need to learn how to believe that in the way we live and in the way we follow God. There was a house that uh, caught fire in the middle of the night. And uh, it was a two-story home, and the bedrooms were upstairs. And the father, when the smoke alarm went off, uh, was awakened, and he quickly woke up his wife and he went to get his two children and he grabbed one, put him over, put over his shoulder and then the other uh, was following him as a four-year-old boy and somehow or another he got loose and he didn't follow the dad down the smoke-filled hallway. Instead, he got stuck in the bedroom and he looked for a place to go where he could be safe and he found a, a corner over by the window away from the flames and away from the smoke and he went there but the father didn't realize that he hadn't been following. When dad and mom and the daughter got outside, they suddenly realized the son was not there. And they were going to go back in, but instead they saw him up by the bedroom window. And he was crying and he was calling out for his parents. And his dad said, jump to me, I will catch you. And the son, because of all the smoke, said, I can't see you. And his dad said, that's okay, I can see you. And you know, life is a lot of times like that. And that is that we, 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 we get so overcome with our circumstances, we get so overcome with the problems that we're facing in life and the difficulties and the challenges, whether they be our, our, our family situations or our health or our financial situations, or our, our, our work situations, or some other issue, and it somehow or another, it, it, it begins to cloud our minds and cloud our thinking, and all we can see is the smoke. All we can see is the smoke of the fire, and it seems to just overwhelm us, and we hear this voice of God saying, Jump! And inside, we have this instinct that says, I can't see you! I don't know, I, I can't, if I jump, it's like I'm going to jump into the air. I don't know what I'm going to land in. And God says, I know what you're going to land in because I'm going to catch you. No, oh, that's a hard thing to do. It takes faith to trust in faithfulness. But that's what God calls us to do. Psalm 119.86 says, All your commands are trustworthy. They're trustworthy. We can count on them. Revelation 21.5, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And I'm telling you, I, I watch the news, and I wonder if they're even telling me the truth sometimes. I listen to a political speech and don't believe anything I hear. And no matter what side of the aisle they're on. <laughs> it, it's just, you know, every because you understand their motives are self-serving. Their motives are often because they want to gain, you know, political favor or they want to get elected or they want, some, they want something from you. And, and we know that very little of it comes out, that comes out of their mouth is honest and trustworthy. But let me tell you something. You get into this book and you get into listening to God, you'll know that whatever he says is trustworthy. True. Take it to the bank. All right. Let's also look at for a moment at the extent of God's faithfulness. How how far does his faithfulness go? You know, are there limits? 
You know, as you say, well, he's faithful up until this point, and then, eh, and then he pulls back. Okay? Well, let, let's see. First of all, our text in Lamentations, it says, what is your faithfulness? Great is your faithfulness. And your mercies are new how often? Every morning. Every morning his mercies are new. So you can count on God's faithfulness to be great. You can count on it to be new. And you can count on it to be daily, at least. And, uh, and then Psalm 36. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. That's a great song as well. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Psalm 36. And, and what does that say? What does that verse mean? I mean, it reaches to the heavens. How far is the heavens? And how far is the sky? I saw something, somebody posted this on, on, uh, online uh, last week or week before, and it, was, it showed the galaxy, the earth, the, the earth in its, in its uh, you know, the planet, it showed our sun, it showed our solar system, then it showed our galaxy, and then it showed other galaxies, and how much we've actually been able to see through telescopes and everything else. And it went out so, many far, so far that it made our, our galaxy, which is like thousands of light years wide, you know, that as huge as the Milky Way galaxy is, it showed our galaxy as this little pinprick and then just way, 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 way out there. And so it keeps on going. So nobody's actually found the end. It just keeps going. And so when, it's, when he says that your love reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the skies, how far does it go then? There is no limit, yeah. It just goes... Infinity times infinity. It's just gone forever. There is no limit. So you can know that's how much God is faithful to you. You say, well, you don't know me. Pat. Oh, yeah, I do. Because you know why? Because I know people. And I know me. <laughs> and I know, human, I know human nature. And so, yeah, and it doesn't matter if I know you or not, God knows you. And he has no limit to what he will do in your life. Psalm 33, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all that he does. So not just in certain things, not just in spiritual things, not just in church things, not just in family things, not just in financial things or physical issues or whatever it might be in your life. It's all things God is faithfulness. So his faithfulness includes everything and everyone and everyone who belongs to him. You know, uh, have you ever, you ever been around somebody, or maybe you even said this to your, you said this yourself. You don't have to raise a hand in a minute, but I'll, uh, I'll just, you know, maybe see here. Maybe you have had something go wrong in your life, okay? Anybody ever have anything wrong go lo- in your life, okay? <coughs> just want to see how many are awake. And, uh, <laughs> all right. If something goes wrong in your life, and have you ever said, yep, it figures, you know, kind of the Murphy's Law thing. You know, yeah, it, it always goes wrong for me. It, it, it figures. You know, I've been having too many good things go lately. It was about time for something bad to happen to me. And, and so when things go wrong, it's like, yep. It fi-. And you know what? That, that's kind of a fatalistic attitude that just says that I'm expecting trouble. I'm expecting failure. I'm expecting these things in my life. Why not take God's faithfulness and His Word for, for what it is, and instead, when something good happens to you, say, yep, it figures. It figures. I mean, God's faithful. I mean, what else should I expect? God's good, God's kind, God's loving. Why shouldn't I expect good stuff to happen to me? I mean, isn't that what he's telling us here? He's faithful. And so if he is, then our attitude ought to be the other way around. It ought to be, yep, it figures. And somebody says, man, you sure are blessed. And go, yeah, I am. You have 14 grandchildren. Yep, I do. Christmas is expensive. Birthdays are expensive, but God's going to provide because He's faithful. 
And when we begin to train our understanding to, to understand who God is and how He works in our life, we'll start expecting His faithfulness, and we'll start living in, in a way that, that will walk in that faithfulness. A lot of it's, you know, a lot of our life is right here between, between these two pieces, Okay. Because that's where the enemy works. There's a, there's a number of books that have been written by Christian authors called The Battle of the Mind. Because that's where, that's where the devil works. Works in your mind. And so understand that God is faithful. And he never changes in that. So how does he demonstrate that in our lives then? Well, I'll give you just a few. Uh, the Bible speaks of this a lot. and Here's a, here's a few of them. Number one, or A, 4A is by keeping his promises and his covenants. And a covenant is simply a formal word for promises. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for who he who promised is faithful. He's the one who promised. See, a promise depends on who keeps it. If I, if I tell you, I am going to give you $100,000. How many believes... A word of it. Okay? See, that's how much blind trust I've gained from you. Yes. Okay. But if you know me, you know that I would love to, to be faithful to that, but there's no money to do that. So, so couldn't do that. So, but so it, but what, if, what if you happen to be fortunate enough to have lunch with Bill Gates or Warren Buffett? And they were to hear your story and say, I'm going to give you $100,000. What would you say then? You would say, thank you, yes. Because the person who promised it to you has the ability to deliver, right? If I promise it to you, you know that I'm going to be showing up with Monopoly money. Okay? But if, God, if somebody who has the, has the cash and it's, not, it's like a drop in the bucket, then they're going to give it to you and you're going to be like, oh, yeah, and they promise it to you, going, yes, it's coming. Well, guess what? If God promises it, then guess what? He's bigger and greater and richer than all these other guys. So trust him. Trust him. Trust him to pay for a new microphone, yes. All right. First Kings, then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands toward heaven and said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way, you have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. And then later in verse 56, he said, Praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. And that's a verse you ought to just write on your forehead. Because that is so deep and so powerful. There's so much right there. Not one word has failed of all the promises that he has made. You can count on the fact that that's how God is, that's who God is, and not one word is going to fail for you as well. Psalm 119, your faithfulness continues through all generations. Now, faithfulness is something that we, we expect from God, but not always from each other. Unfortunately, I, I, I saw uh, something a few years ago, actually. Uh, I can't remember where this was. It was a sign, though, in a, in, a, uh, in a shop. I don't know if it was a jewelry shop or a pawn shop that said, we rent wedding rings. <laughs> <laughs> Just let that one sink in for a bit, you know. What does that say? I don't know if they do 24-year rentals, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was like, we rent wedding rings. What is that? It's like, okay, you don't expect, you know, marrying Kim Kardashian or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Here's what we know. 
Men fail. Women fail. God never fails. Simple. But when you have someone in your life that doesn't fail you, boy, it makes a difference. It makes a difference on, on what you do, how you think, how you live, and what you expect. I love this story. It was told by John Maxwell in his book, The Treasure of a Friend. And uh, it says that Earl C. Wheeler uh, told the story of two men who grew up to be best friends. And though Jim was just a little older than Philip and often assumed the role of leader, they did everything together. They even went to high school and college together, and after college they decided to join the Marines. And by a unique series of circumstances, they were sent to Germany together where they fought side by side in one of history's ugliest wars. And one sweltering day during a fierce battle amid heavy gunfire, bombing, and close quarter combat, they were given the command to retreat, and, and the men were running back. As the men were running back, Jim noticed that Philip had not returned with the others. Panic gripped his heart. Jim knew that if Philip was not back in another minute or two, that he was not going to make it. And so Jim begged his commanding officer to let him go after his friend. But the officer forbade the request, saying it would be suicide. Risking his own life, Jim disobeyed his orders and went after Philip. His heart pounding, he ran into the gunfire, calling out for Philip. And a short time later, his platoon saw him hobbling across the field, carrying a limp body in his arms. Jim's commanding officer upbraided him, shouting that it was a foolish waste of time and an outrageous risk. Your friend is dead, he added, and there was nothing you could do. No, sir, you're wrong, Jim replied. I got there just in time. Right before his, he died, his last words to me were, I knew you would come. I knew you would come. Do you have friends like that in life today? We're getting ready to start a new discipleship uh, program. And one of the questions that's asked in this, uh, in this program that I'm, I'm putting together is, um, how many how many friends do you have? How many people do you have in your life that you would call 2 a.m. friends? And the definition is of a 2 a.m. friend is you can call them anytime at 2 a.m. and they'll be quick to answer and come right over. Do you have any 2 a.m. friends? And Jim and Philip were 2 a.m. friends. They were battlefield friends. They were lifelong friends that there was nothing that they wouldn't do for one another. And how incredible that Philip's last thing that he saw was that his friend did not let him down. But he was there for him. I want you to know there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and his name is Jesus. And he will never leave you, and he will never forsake you, and he will always be there for you. And you can count on Him. When you think and you feel like the heavens are brass and God's not around, guess what? He is right there. And He will show up just at the right moment. He keeps His promises and His covenants. B stands by His people and save, saves them even when they are unfaithful to Him. 2 Timothy 2 says, If we are faithless... He remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. You ever ask the question in prayer, God, why do you stick with me? <laughs> Lord, I've let you down so many times. Why are you still there for me? And, and God's answer is because I love you and I will always be there for you. Our security is in His faithfulness, not our own. And that's the problem. If we, we often don't go to God in prayer. We often don't show up at, at certain things because somehow or another we know we've let God down. You know, if, if you let somebody down, you want to just show up at their house the next day? No, because they're going to look at you and go, you let me down. Guess what? You show up at God's house, He doesn't look at you and say, what are you doing here? You let me down. No, He says, oh, I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad you're here. 
Because you know what? That's what the devil does. When you fail God, the devil tries to fill your mind with so much guilt and so much shame that you don't want to be around God or his people anymore. And so you stay away because you don't want to have to to talk about it or deal with it or face the fact that you've let God down. But the thing is, that's just exactly the way the devil works. God says, no, 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 show up because I am faithful to you. And I will always, and I want you here. I want you in my life. I want you, you know, in prayer. And so, have you ever noticed that after you've sinned or, or, or committed some offense, how hard it is to pray after that? Because you're so ashamed, you don't, you're like, oh, God. You don't want to talk to God. You want to avoid God. It's just the opposite of what we should do. That God is pulling you in. He is faithful, so we trust in Him. Three, or C, by not allowing temptations too great for us to handle. I'm sure glad for that. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So we, we understand His faithfulness in that. 2 Thessalonians 3. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. We've heard this saying, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Because God's coming. God's going to show up. He'll be there. Don't put your ultimate trust in doctors or others' opinions, but trust in God. D, He is faithful to us by chastening His children when they go astray. By the way, that's a good thing. Children, if you grew up in a home where your parents disciplined you and chastened you, be thankful. One night, Psalm 119, I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous, that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Wow. Thank you, Lord, for afflicting me, is what that's saying. Because it, it kept me on the straight and narrow. It kept me in the direction I needed to go. It changed the direction. I was heading headlong into a life of hell, and God, you turned me around, and so put me right back where I needed to be. And sometimes... We need to hit bottom. Sometimes we need a wake-up call. Sometimes we need a slap in the face, a kick in the hiney. And that's sometimes what God does or allows to happen in our lives. Hebrews 12, 6, Because the Lord disciplines the one He loves, and He chastens everyone He accepts as His son. So if He's not disciplining you, that's a bad thing. He chastens those who are His sons. Our children need faithful discipline to keep them from harm and shape their lives. So do we. Be thankful that He is faithful in this area as well. E, He is faithful by forgiving us when we confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is what? Faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right, Memorize that verse for good. To doubt that your sin is forgiven is to question His righteousness and faithfulness. It is not humility... To say, oh, God could never forgive me. Oh, my sin is too great. My sin is too deep. And, I, you know, God forgave you. That's because your life wasn't as bad as mine. Sorry, but that's not humility. That's presumption. And it's a lack of faith. The lack of faith in a God who said that he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then finally, letter F, he is faithful by answering the prayers of his children. Psalm 143 says, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. And he does. True story of a missionary to the cannibals in the South Sea Islands. And his name is Roy C. Roy Angel. And he wrote a book called Iron Shoes. And in there he says this, I had set up a camp in a dangerous tribe of cannibals, and day after day I pled with the old chief to let me preach to his people. And I would speak his language, and I told him the story of Jesus with all the fervor of my heart. He listened attentively, but was not convinced. I had not paid much attention to his son, who sat just beside him, until one day the sun came to, me, to my tent with questions that were penetrating and so penetrating that they startled me. The weeks wore on and I was a virtual prisoner. And then one day toward the sunset, 
the tom-toms began to beat, and the tribe began to gather, and a huge fire was built. Two rough young giants led me to the center of the ring and tied me to the stake. The old chief held his powwow, and a death sentence was passed on me. Wild dancing and carousing followed way into the night. And finally, it was stilled by the old chiefs standing and holding out both hands. And he made a speech to me and added uh, at its end this question, Where is your God? If he is able to deliver you, I will believe in him. My answer was drowned out by the wild yells and delight of the dance as the dance resumed. And then suddenly the old chief's son, a tall young giant who carried a long sword that had been taken from a, pri a pirate boat, walked into the middle of the circle and stood with his back to me. And he whipped out his long sword out of its scatter and a hush fell over the orgy. In a clear, unfaltering voice he said, The missionary's God is busy tonight, and so he sent me to deliver him. There will be no feast tonight. The missionary lives. If any of you objects, I am waiting. And a long silence followed, broken only by quiet whispers among the braves. The old chief stepped forward into the circle. The young giant pointed the long sword at the ground in front of his father, and his voice was quiet, but it was lethal. You may come two more steps, no further. The old chief stopped and stood and looked at his son, and there was an admiration all over his face. He lifted both of his hands, and he turned back to face the tribe, and he said, Tonight, I advocate as chief in favor of my son. From now on, he is your chief. Obey his commands. And he turned and faced his son and said, May I have permission to cut the ropes that bind the prisoner? He closes the story. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Trusting in the faithfulness of God. You know, if he would have even died on that stake, he would have died trusting in the faithfulness of God. Because he would have known that that would have been the cause to bring that tribe to Christ. Sometimes heaven seems like it's brass. Sometimes it feels like our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and coming back. But yet we should be comforted today to know that he already and always hears and he answers. The answer may not always be what you expect or what you want, but it, he answers. Because he knows what's best, the same way that a parent knows what's best for a child. And when your four-year-old wants to drive the car, you know not to say yes. <laughs> he is faithful to, to do some important things in our lives. And let me just give you two of them today and we'll close. One, he's faithful to forgive sin. That's the most important thing you and I can know today. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen. It doesn't matter if you've been a, a, a believer and in church all your life, but yet you've got secret sin. God says, I'm ready to forgive. And he's faithful to do that right now. And secondly, he's faithful to answer prayer. Hudson Taylor was a great missionary. He said once, he said, a little thing is a little thing. But faithfulness in a little thing is a great thing. How much faithfulness changes everything? It makes all the difference when we understand that God does things. How many know that God is even faithful in little things in your life? And he shows up in ways where you just think, Lord, Why? Why did you even think of me? Why were you even that thoughtful and that caring to do that in my life? I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Brian and worship you come back. I want to sing that hymn that we sang earlier, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great old hymn of the church. And I'd like to give you a little history behind it. The hymn Great Faithfulness was written by Thomas Chisholm. And Thomas Chisholm was uh, 
born in a Lincoln-like log cabin in Kentucky. And as a young adult, he was converted by the evangelist H.C. Morrison. Chisholm's death, or excuse me, his health was unstable. And he alternated between bouts of illness and gainful employment in which he did everything from journalism to insurance to evangelistic work. Through all the ups and downs, he discovered new blessings from God every morning. Lamentations 3 became precious to him. And he wrote this hymn after 30 years of serving Christ. It was relatively unknown until it was popularized around the world by George Beverly Shea and the choirs at Billy Graham Crusades. At Billy Graham's 1954 Haringey Crusade, Wilbur Conkle first heard, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and a flood of memories coursed through his mind. And he recalled the dark nights of World War II when London was nearly bombed to oblivion. Each night as the enemy planes came over, Conkle wrote, we cast our care upon him. And he said, I quoted this scripture to myself, and I used it in my prayers. Those were dark days, and at times they seemed hopeless. And it was in those darkest hours that God proved his faithfulness to me. We were so near death, and yet it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. And it is because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Would you stand and let's take a moment as we close this service to acknowledge the faithfulness of the Lord. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they
Father, this morning we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, that it never fails. And Lord, we can always run to you knowing you're right there. Thank you, and Lord, bless us as we go in Jesus' name. And a whole church said, amen. Have a great Sunday.